Hi, and thank you for coming today. Thank you for tuning in uh, if you have done at home, and uh, thank you to my, my limited but, but uh, socially distanced audience here. Uh, my name is Adam Lee. I'm head of department, head of drama here at Pocklington School. Uh, I've been a teacher for many years. I've taught in um, the independent sector, the maintained sector, uh, international sector in South Korea for a while, uh, primary and secondary. And I want to talk to you today about my experience of the overwhelming power of play and creativity. Oh, no, not me. I'm not a very creative person. Maybe you've heard someone else say that. Maybe you've said it yourself. I certainly hear it a lot. Uh, I hear it mostly in, in adult friends of mine and, um, and family friends and acquaintances. It's something I've, I've heard a lot throughout my life. And I, I wonder where that comes from. Why do people assume that? Oh, no, not me. I'm, I'm not a creative person. Well, I, I don't believe that, and I, I believe everybody has an innate capacity to be creative. And it, it comes from our sense and our desire and our need to play. Now, I think, I think we get enjoyment out of play, certainly as, as, as children. We, we learn through play. Um, it's something we desire to do. It's fun. But more than that, I, th I think we need to play. I think it's a fundamental part of, of human nature. Um, and not only that, I, I think it's a fundamental part of, of all nature. And so I've got a, a short film I want to show you um, to illustrate that. The film I'm going to show you is shot in uh, Canada, in northern Canada, right on the edge of where humans um, live in, in the world, you know, right on the edge of the, the Arctic Circle in the wilderness. And there's a chap called Brian, there's, there's Brian. And Brian's got his husky dogs, and quite often they have polar bears coming down from the Arctic. And the polar bears, um, you know, bring a threat with them. They're, they're hungry, they, they want to eat. And uh, they, they have been known to attack dogs and attack people. But an interesting phenomenon happens here with Brian's dogs. So, have a look. Two natural predators in empathy. How is it that Brian's dogs and these bears seem to have reached such a remarkable understanding? I can't say I know all the answers. I just know that when there's a bad relationship, the other dogs know it we move it out, but if the relationships are casual and they're, they're very exploratory, they're, bears are social, very individualistic, but they have a uh, social adaptability. Uh, this is a social order here, it's a social thing and they're sort of um, enjoying it. So what's remarkable about this is that these are predators and they're hungry and these bears have come down from the Arctic and in the past, they've, they've, they've threatened and, and attacked and eaten the dogs. But these dogs have approached them in the spirit of play, and they've transcended all of that. And they've, they've ended up having this wonderful, playful relationship. And so my argument, and I think this illustrates, is, is that play is, is a fundamental part of all nature, actually. It's not just across cultures in, in human uh, nature. It, it transcends species. 
And, and that, I think, is testament to the kind of power of, of play in our lives. And perhaps we have lost sight of that. And I wonder if we value it as much in modern society as we should. And I, I want to talk a little bit about how we can, we can reconnect with that today. And so we're going to start with, with an activity. Now, at home, hopefully, you've got a couple of sheets of paper. If you printed out the ones uh, that we suggested, that's fine. You, there's one with some circles on the side. Don't worry about that. Just a plain piece of paper is fine. Uh, and so I've got a limited audience here, but you're going to do it with me uh, for the sense of real time. But at home, whoever you're with, and I hope there's a mixture of, of young and old, but whoever you're with, I want you to, to, to look at the person next to you. And on your piece of paper, you're going to have just 30 seconds to draw a portrait, so you're going to have to be quick, a portrait of the person next to you. Off you go. Draw that, draw that picture now. My limited audience here, I can see some feverish uh, drawing and some looking. Good. It's not long. You're going to have to be quick. A portrait of, <laughs> of that person next to you. Good. Wrapping it up in about 10 seconds. Three, two, one, and stop. Okay. Okay. And there's a bit of chuckling going on. There's some reactions. Good. There's a couple of people here who've, who've done that. I, I hope at home that you're, you're showing these to each other and, you know, some of the common um, responses to this. I'm, oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. I, look what I've done to your face. Uh, I'm, I'm dreadfully sorry. Please don't look at this. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, that's, that's common. That's good. Uh, less, less so with children, I find. I think some of, the, some of the younger people I've done this with, and obviously in this remote sense, it's hard to get a sense of what's going on at home. But when I've done this with a, with a larger audience, um, you do tend to get those apologies from some of the adults going, oh my goodness, I am so sorry for what you're about to see. Whereas that doesn't necessarily happen with, with the younger uh, pupils I've done this with, the, the, the younger students, the children. They, they're just drawing all sorts, you know, heads with arms and legs and all sorts of funky teeth and hair, and it just it doesn't matter. Um, and it's that, it's that instinct to apologise that is a sort of giveaway to some of the things that I'm talking about, of, of are we valuing that sense of play and have we nurtured it enough into our adult lives to keep it as, as part, of our, uh, part of our routine, part of our, our confidence, part of the way we operate. And that desire to apologise, I think, is a, a canary in the coal mine in some ways of, of some of the problems, which I'll come on to later, historically in our education system, which may have led us towards that. Because is, is, is it that we've become less creative, or is it that we've forgotten how to play? Um, and at this point, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, a great mentor of mine, uh, I've been watching his work for years, I'm sure you've heard of him, called um, Sir, Sir Ken Robinson, um, the late, great Sir Ken Robinson, who unfortunately died last year uh, in 2020. And he's been talking about play and creativity in education for years. And what I'm saying today, I, I know there's, there's nothing new in this, but I, I do think that there's an opportunity uh, with the dreadful pandemic that we've been through um, to, to look at how we can take some of these well-established ideas and really implement them. And so I, I want to quote Ken because he talked about this, this tension between adults apologising for, for their creativity and, and children just not doing it. And he, he told this story, and he told it often, and I think it bears repeating. And he spoke about uh, a child who was restless at school, primary school child who was fairly restless, and teachers spoke of this, this child's... Um, you know, slightly disruptive behaviour and slightly restless nature, uh, apart from in art. And in, in the arts class, this child was very calm. And this child was really focused and, and loved drawing. And in one of these art classes, um, the teacher went over to the child and said, what, what are you drawing? And the child said, uh, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, well, that's, that's impossible. I mean, nobody knows what God looks like. And the child said, uh, they will in a minute. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and continue drawing. And I, I just, I love that story. And I, I think what it illustrates is that, is that children aren't afraid to do that. They'll, they'll have a go. They'll just go for it. And this sense that we need to apologise for things when we're older and we're, we're, we're afraid to, to kind of let go of that sense of play is, is, is something we need to look at. So in order to try and nurture that, let's do another exercise. So at home, again, um, you should have some plain paper um, I haven't sent these out, but they're so simple to do. What I need you to do, because some, some of them uh, in, in my audience here will have these. I've got a couple of templates here for you. And 
on your blank sheet of paper, I'd just like you to draw one of those. So I've put them on the screen for you. And this is an activity called incomplete figures. And incomplete figures means you start with a line or a squiggle or a se series of, of, of shapes on a page. And you can choose either one of these. I don't mind which one, but just, just choose one of them. And just draw that very simply onto your paper at home. And then you're going to have uh, another 30 seconds to use that as a starting point and then create your own image from that. It can go in any direction you want. Whatever idea that initial shape gives you, you start from those lines and you extend it and you turn that into your own drawing. All right? You've got 30 seconds. Off you go. Good. Some people are off and running already. There's a couple of moments of sort of frozen panic in here. What, what am I going to do? I've got no ideas. But now people are off and running. And as soon as you've got that idea, you just go with it. Good. I'm seeing some feverish pen movement in here. Hopefully at home that's happening with you as well. And you've taken an idea and you're running with it. And you're extending it in some exciting way. Could have gone in any direction. You've taken the plunge. You've gone in one direction. You follow that and you, you go for it. And hopefully we're going to wrap this up fairly soon. Three, two, one, and pause where you are. Now, you could extend this and you, you, you could carry on doing it, and I'm sure you could elaborate and do this for a long time. Um, what, what kind of directions did we go out in here? I'll just take a test. What, what sort of thing did we go with? Let's have a look. A rocket ship. Okay, brilliant. Some boosters on the bottom and a rocket ship, and there's some stars and clouds and went off that way. Um, up the back there, what, what did we go with there? A dog. A, a dog with a food bowl. So that was, okay, brilliant. Okay, excellent. Well, I, I haven't got those to show you at home, but I do have some examples. A couple of chaps that I found online who, who did this. There's, there's a couple of examples um, of, of some of their interpretations. An eye and then someone pushing over a glass. They're quite interesting, you know, different routes to go down. Um, and then there was some really silly stuff over here, um, which I thought was great, um, uh, including this guy with the kind of inflatable wavy arm advertising guy. I thought that was absolute genius. So well done, those chaps. I found that online. Um, and I, I think what this activity shows is, is, is nurturing that sense of, of play and divergent thinking. Because you can do this activity again. You can give people the same shape and say, right, have another go. And another go. And another go. And it just takes you in that different direction. And I, I, I think it's a, a wonderful sense of, of freedom with it. Um, and you end up generating ideas that even perhaps you didn't realise were, were, were going to pop up in your mind. It's, it's a really lovely activity um, for, for, for fostering that kind of divergent thinking. And it's one of the activities where, we're, in a way, we're setting up rules to break the rules of convention. And this idea of having rules to break rules is a sort of counterintuitive thing. But it's, it's, it's really, you know, it's well researched. And, and in order to foster and, and to develop that sense of play and creativity and, and, you know, develop creativity as a competence, as a skill, we kind of need these rules. We need these activities and these bits in our, um, in our research, in our education, um, and in our activities in order to, to foster that. And there's another one I want to come on to now. Um, which is the 30 circles exercise. So another piece of paper that you should have there. Uh, if you turn over at home, if you've printed off the paper, there should be a paper which has um, something that looks like that. Something that looks like that with many, many circles on it. And we'll talk about this activity in a minute. Um, but this is another one where we're setting some parameters in order to try and unlock that, that flow of creativity and that, that sense of play. So the task is very simple. Again, just uh, 30 seconds. Um, in fact, no, I'll give, give you a minute for this. I'll give you a minute, a bit longer. A minute, and what you've got to do is try and fill out as many of those circles as you can with, with something. So there's an example I can show you here. Uh, I'm not going to show it to you for too long, but uh, there's an example of the sort of things you could do with this activity. And the idea is in one minute to try and fill out as many of those as you can. Ready, steady, go. If at home you're thinking I haven't printed out this sheet, just do as many as you can circular ideas on a blank sheet of paper is fine.
good. Why? Um, helpful distance audience are feverishly going about their work here. Getting a bit longer than last time. So that's just over 30 seconds. And let me give you a minute. See how many you can do. And hopefully at home you are enjoying this and filling out those circles as best you can. Three, two, one, and you can stop there. Right, so this is a bit pens down. Um, my distance audience here, and hopefully at home, you, you, you can be honest uh, with each other as well. How, how many did you get here? Twelve. Twelve. Eleven. Eleven. Eleven or twelve. Okay, great. Um, and any kind of... Um, did, you, did you use some of the things that I did as the examples? Anybody use that? Maybe there's a stop sign and some other stuff, yes, over there. Or maybe a variation on a theme. Sometimes at home you may have done a series of emojis, different, different smiley faces and things. Or a simple of different clock faces, you know, different numbers. There's, there's, there's no real rule to this. I wasn't asking you to be ingeniously creative and, and make an artwork of each one. The idea and the task was just to fill them out. And so I've seen people just write all numbers in them or just do a variation on a theme or, you know, one where someone put them all together as a caterpillar and just put a face on the end, which I thought was fantastic. So the idea is just, just to try and produce quantity over quality. And it's setting up a, a parameter to do that. And the, the guy who, who invented this was uh, this guy called Bob McKim, um, years ago at the Stanford Design Program in America. And he was trying to get his students to, to just generate ideas without overthinking them. And by doing that, more original creative work came up. I mean, I saw someone doing this where they were just writing numbers, and then they got bored of the numbers and started writing different symbols. And those symbols were just things that they hadn't even thought of before. They were different shapes, and they started to you know, have something really aesthetic involved in there. And if you go for quantity over quality, you're putting aside your inhibitions and the pressure on yourself to try and be original. And often that desire to be original, that fear of judgment, holds us back. So this idea of sort of creating rules to break rules is really important. Because I think we've got to ask where that fear comes from of being judged and making mistakes. And I think it could partly, and we'll talk about it later, it could partly be due, be due to some of the things we do in our education system because we spend a lot of time uh, in lessons and teaching when we're leading towards an exam, making sure that we're teaching not to make a mistake. And I think if we're constantly afraid of making mistakes and they're the worst thing that you can make. We, we lose this, this, this sense of, of have a go and trying it, where actually real innovation and, and real creativity comes from. Um, and I'm not saying examination and testing should not be in the system. We'll come back to this later. Of course it should be. It should absolutely be part of it. But my contention is it probably shouldn't be the dominant part of it. Um, so, yeah, Bob, Bob McKim um, was mentioned by uh, a guy called Tim Brown, who did a wonderful talk called Tales of Playing Creativity in education um, uh, many years ago. But he is now the CEO of a design company called IDEO. And the idea of this, this, this nurturing of play and the power of play being something for ourselves and making us develop, and, and that, it, it's not just a personal thing, it's an economic thing. It's a practical thing. It's, it's, it's the competences that we need young people to develop and carry into their adult working lives. So it's an economic thing. Um, the World Economic Forum um, said recently that by 2020, and we've passed that now, creativity was up there with the top three most important skills that we need in the workplace. Along with critical thinking and collaborative teamwork, it was creative thought and creativity. Creativity should be up there with literacy and numeracy. And some of our education systems haven't caught up with that yet. And I think, as I'll talk about at the end, this is the time, and there's an appetite to really look at that. The way we gather evidence, the way we set work, the way we assess things, the opportunities we give to engage um, young minds in genuinely independent, creative thoughts is, is you know, the, the time is now. Um, and I think excessive homework and marking and other things, they, there's, there's evidence to show that these things aren't developing the skills that we need. And... Uh, there are other ways to assess things. And this dreadful pandemic, there's one thing that's come out of it, is 
is we have had to, as we've been doing very recently in schools, you know, this week and, and others, we've, in a way we've never done before, we're having to reevaluate the streams of evidence we're going to use to, to accredit the, the, uh, the outcome of a student. And I think there's a real opportunity here. Um, right, this one's not a drawing exercise, but we're going to do one more exercise before, before we come on to, to some of that stuff about education at the end. Um, and it's a, another simple uh, activity. It's one that you may have heard of before. It's called the paperclip exercise. And this one you can just have discussion. You can write things down at home if you want to with your, with, with your family. Um, but here, uh, there's only a few people in the audience here, but you guys are going to discuss and come up with some ideas. As many as you can. Again, just 30 seconds for this. Alternative uses for a paperclip. All right, we all know a paperclip. We all know what one looks like. We all know what we can do with it. What else can you do with it? I'm going to see how many different uses you can come up with in the next 30 seconds. Off you go. Good. First few, fairly easy. I don't know, hairpin or other things, but I wonder how many weird and wonderful things you can create with the paper clip. Ooh, yeah, still, still the pen going down. There's still some people writing some things down here. Maybe you could be discussing this at home. That's absolutely fine. And three, two, one, and stop there. Right, so how many sort of roughly did we come up with? What sort of ideas do we have? Yes. Six. Six is pretty good. I think we can do more than six. Um, if we did more than six at home, that's absolutely fantastic. I've, I've got some examples here uh, which, which were, were done before. So, you know, there's, there's plenty more, and I'm sure if you've got loads of different ideas at home, that's fantastic. But it's another simple exercise to do, um, which is just trying to set up some, some rules in order for you to develop that competency of play and creativity and think in that divergent way. So I think we need to find space for this in the curriculum. I do. And of course it's a personal thing. and we, we want to be engaging in, in, in things that we enjoy doing. But if we're doing things that we enjoy and we love and that we're good at, that, that is where we're playing with ideas. And I find that and, and I think um, Einstein said it, play is the highest form of research. And I think when I see students in school who are really engaged with, with something that they're uh, investigating or something that they're researching or, or a piece of work that they're doing or extended project qualification, they're playing with ideas. And they're using knowledge, absolutely. Knowledge and examination and testing should be part of that. You must learn things. You must learn things and be examined on that knowledge, of course. But it shouldn't dominate everything at the expense of this, it, this creative exploration of ideas. That's critical thinking, um, which the World Economic Forum were, were talking about. Creativity. These are the competences that we need. And I, I think it's a moment where, where it takes courage to do this. And I'm, I'm lucky to be working as, in a school where, where they do focus, and the school leaders here do focus on the whole individual and not just the results that they're... Um, they're in, interested in. And, uh, there's a slide here which, which has some of those values and, and, and um, aspirations uh, listed. Because when a student that I'm seeing finds that crossroads between their aptitude, what they're good at, and what they love doing, you can see them light up and engage with their learning. And they want to do it, and they want to investigate it, and they want to develop it. And that is when they're playing with ideas. And that, in, in the same fundamental way as the polar bears and everything else, it's when we switch on. It's when we're engaged. It's not necessarily when we're rote learning. And this isn't reserved for the arts. You can do wonderfully creative things in the arts, of course. But I think you can do it everywhere. And I wonder if the exam system, in the dominant way that it is, precludes some of that. And I'll come on to some statistics later. So, for example, when, when a student is engaged in this, in whatever interest they're in, that's when they're starting to become their authentic self. And I like this word, being authentic. I think as adults we know when we meet people who are authentic and we know when we feel at our most authentic and it's when we're, we're, we're happiest and we're most content. Um, 
it's, it's being true to ourselves and true to what we are good at and what we enjoy doing. And that can come in any form. So uh, classics and modern foreign languages. I've, I've been worked with students over the years who, who are really into you know, new translations. And you know, I mean, in the theatre world, Anya Rice, a uh, playwright, is doing radical new translations of Chekhov. And I've seen students really engage with that. And if they had the opportunity to do that as an independent project, as part of their portfolio of evidence of assessment, that would be something engaging. Radical new translations of, of classic texts or, or modern foreign languages. Um, you know, geography, business and economics, you know, we have young enterprise schemes already. And the young enterprise program is fantastic. Why can't that be a kind of mainstream body of evidence which, which, which a student is engaged with to, to prove how they've learned and developed their skills rather than an exam? Um, history and, and politics, you know, we're in, a, we're in an age where the, the current generation are finding a new voice in this post-racial society that we're heading for and, and hopefully building and they need to find the voice for that and they need to be looking at the history and willing to learn and to articulate their own vision of the new future which we're heading into and again I'm not sure if the dominance of the exam system allows that. And all these different streams, whether it's history, drama, um, maths, science, music, uh, classics, modern foreign languages, whatever part of the curriculum you're in, if that's what you're engaged with and it's your authentic self and you're playing with ideas, that's got to be a good thing. It's got to be. So the solutions. What are the solutions? Well, I've, I've taught um, in several places, but I have taught the, the International Baccalaureate. And I, I think this is a, a good starting point. The IB is, is, is a different program to the three A-levels we run in this country. Um, it's a, a broader curriculum, and it has six areas that you study at higher or standard level. Uh, it's centered around a philosophy, the IB learner profile, uh, as I've put here. And it's centered around in, independent projects, the theory of knowledge, community action service, and the extended essay, which is, which is an independent project. Now, th these things do exist in our system. We have the EPQ, extended project qualification, the HPQ, um, lower down the school. And, and there are these other things like Young Enterprise and these other things which run alongside our exam system, which, which are there. They're ripe for the picking. They're ripe to be developed. And now is the time. And I think that's what we need to look at. We need to have courage to do that. The obvious uh, question is, how would you evidence this? Well, I won't go into all those solutions now, but I, my, my, I would advocate a significant reform of the role of the personal tutor. Not in a safeguarding way. Schools do safeguarding brilliantly. But I think the role of the personal tutor could come in to mentor students and to uh, build that body of evidence so that it can be relied upon and it can be... Uh, a robust set of evidence of other independent um, projects which are not uh, assessed by final examination. Um, things like charity work or, or volunteering, um, or as I said, the Young Enterprise Programme. Any kind of independent project, I think, subject-based, would, would allow students uh, to to show their skills and, and find their element and become their authentic selves much more readily. Right, um, one more activity for you uh, before I talk about some statistics. Because I think, as I've, if I try to illustrate, this, this fundamental power of play is something we need, we need to, to recentre um, at the heart of what we do in education. There are amazing school leaders out there amazing teachers in this country and we need to let them do their jobs they know how to educate and some of the systems that we are working within and sometimes swimming against the, the currents that's what we need to look at and I want to give you some statistics because not only do I think these philosophies have been around for ages it's nothing new but I think now is the time and there is an appetite for change so whilst I'm doing that you've got some some bits of paper here and bits of paper at home I would like you to try and create the ultimate flying machine whilst I'm giving you these rather dry statistics at the end. So uh, you're going to launch this and hopefully if you're in a big auditorium here with me you can fire them all at me but you're going to have to fire them as you can at home. So you've got these bits of paper before we put them in the recycling I'd like you to, um, to have a look at uh, creating the ultimate flying machine. So you can start doing that now. You start folding your pieces of paper and doing that as I read you some, some stats. The Office for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, international organisation, 
uh, were quoted uh, in the Times the other day. The headline was, Scrap outdated exams and give teachers a bigger role. And I could not agree more. Um, Larry Flanagan, General Secretary at the Educational Institute of Scotland, said, As we strive to eradicate the poverty-related attainment gap and create equity in education, an increased emphasis on qualifications based on classroom evidence and continuous assessment would help ensure a level of fairness that cannot be achieved under the exam system. And I couldn't agree more. Um, the Times newspaper have set up an education commission uh, during this pandemic uh, to really drill down and look at some of the enforced changes that we've had to bring in, the evidence streams we've had to look at, the way we've been calculating grades, some of the mistakes that have been made, but some of the opportunities. And I applaud it. On the commission are Anne Longfield, former Children's Commissioner, uh, Lord Rees of Ludlow, he's the Astronomer Royal, um, and the Educationist uh, Sir Anthony Selden, among others. Now they've been doing some surveys as part of their work. Um, I hope your flying machines are coming on very well, by the way, whilst I'm doing these, good. Some people here still doing that. But they're quite shocking, and I think this is where not just the opportunity for change is here, but the appetite. So in terms of homework, the emphasis on, on homework and marking and preparing and not making mistakes for exams, the emphasis on homework, 70% of teachers feel that there is too much emphasis on homework and only 15% disagreed. 70%. That's, that's overwhelming. Only 20% believed that homework and marking were essential. The only 20% believed that homework and marking were, were essential. And 57% think it's not essential. And there are other systems that do this around the world. I won't go into them all now, but you know, places like Finland, are, there's no homework set, there's very little testing, there's a huge amount of community-linked projects, independent projects which the students are doing, and they're thriving. In primary school, 62% um, were against homework entirely, and only 24% of teachers were in favour. 62%. And those are the teachers. And the teachers are the people who, who, who know what they're talking about. They know how to educate people. We have brilliant teachers and brilliant school leaders. And if 70% of them are telling us that the emphasis is wrong, we need to be listening. As well as the parents. So over 40% of parents think there's too much emphasis on homework and marking in the preparation for examination and testing. And the parents are the ones who should be trusting us. So I, I, I think... If, if the parents are the ones who, uh, you know, nearly half of them are ringing the alarm bell, we also need to look at that. And finally, the big one about exams. The highest one of all. And quite a shocking description in the question. But 77% um, of the teachers surveyed thought that the examination system, the focus on exams, had hindered their pupils' learning. Now, I think that is a fundamental issue. This is 77% of teachers are thinking that the focus on the established exam system is hindering pupils' learning, then we've got to have a look at that. And I, I think it, it goes without saying that there's an opportunity here, but there is an appetite for it as well. We've got to trust our teachers to do this. Finally, finishing with a quote, Kevin Courtney, Joint General Secretary of the National Education Union, said, what is abundantly clear from teachers and school leaders is that they want to be allowed to get on with their job. We need the government to leave the classroom alone while at the same time supporting schools and colleges to afford additional staff, reduce class sizes, and focus on individual learning unhindered by a restrictive curriculum. The return of the dead hand of Ofsted is the very last thing we need right now. So you've got your paper airplanes ready then? Good? Okay, so you're going to hit me here. Okay, that was rubbish. There's another one there. We've got any more coming in? That's not a plane. That's something else. Hopefully at home you're letting these fly around the place. Uh, thank you very much. Those are absolutely terrible. My, my, I'm sorry if you're at home. My, my, my established audience here helping me with this presentation are not doing very well. That was marginally better. Okay, thank, one more. Thank you. That's not a plane, but well done. Um, right, thank you for listening. I, I just want to finish by saying now, now is the time. Um, the opportunity has presented itself, uh, the appetite for change is here, so let's trust those brilliant school teachers, those brilliant school leaders across the country and give them the changes they need to bring the power of play uh, back to the centre and the heart of their education. Thank you for listening.